I traveled through Russia. I identified as a Ukrainian. I spoke Ukrainian, but it had different consequences in Vladivostok, Siberia, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Nizhny Novgorod. Nizhny Novgorod used to be a secret city where Sakharov was jailed from 1980 to 1986 for protesting the Afghanistan war, which the Soviet Union actually lost, but withdrew its forces only in contemporary Russia in 1992. Ideology is extremely important because it works at school, university, from TV, but also at the hipster cafe on Nevsky Prospect. This is what people think when they make their everyday decisions. As with the Afghanistan war, propaganda has its saying in justifying bombing women, children, civilians in general, but also soldiers. That has nothing to do with the imperialist ambitions of one state, the Russian Federation. Propaganda is at core at justifying bombing civilians, women and children. Ruskis were always known for breaking the rules of law, but now it's all going live and you can see how they're twisting narratives and trying to persuade that they're not doing what they're doing and try to steal the show. A poster that you've probably seen on the first page of the Financial Times, uh, on Vice News, we are not for the war, we're against the war, Ruskis are against the war. Probably it persuaded you that there is some diversity. This comes from the person who worked on such mythology as a crucified boy in Donetsk and that 86% uh, of Russians support the war in Ukraine. I think it's really important to see how this can deflect us from understanding what propaganda does in Russia. Critical thinking is the only thing that can help us to understand how this KGB FSB playbook tricks our mind to believe something that is not in the reality. Critical thinking means that you have to react not with your emotions, but with a really strict table, like at, a, like at an IELTS exam, with pros and cons and then your opinionated conclusion. Yes, it's kind of post-truth, but at the same time, it belongs to your mind, not your heart. That's the paradox. There has been a tendency of Russian propagandists to leave their channels and try to kind of defend their position. Yeah, they've been lying for eight years, but suddenly they realize that the war against Ukraine is lost, so they want to change their shoes. Well, you may think that there is some break inside the system. But knowing the history of Russia, I'll tell you, they're just changing puns while they want to preserve their hierarchy and play the game once again until they win. Let's do a critical analysis of whether Marina Zavsennikov's deed is a bravery or just a media stunt that makes us believe that Russians changed their mind, that they realized what they were doing for eight years or maybe for the whole time of their lives, uh, making money out of killing people in media. So let's start with the bio of Marina Zavsennikova. In her address to the general public that she published through uh, Ksenia Sobchak, someone close to Putin, she says that, yeah, I've been lying for eight years. I'm sorry for that. I'm taking it back. I want to be a different person. Why would she do that? So the people who try to support her say that, you know, she has two children, she's a brave woman. Well, they're shifting their attention from actually, you know, more than 2,000 people died in Mariupol alone and the Russian forces bombed the maternal house while women were dying while giving birth. Are her children better than Ukrainian children? Uh, the biggest paradox is that she has been released in 24 hours and instead of facing criminal charges as has happened with people who posted on Facebook against uh, Crimea being Russian, she went with a simple fine of 30,000 rubles, which is probably like $150, she makes it in one night. So there is a particular article 
which is used to persecute people who are protesting against the war. It's criminal code 207.3. And for some reason, she went through an administrative punishing. And after she got detained, she gave a lot of interviews saying, you know, her narratives. So this article in the criminal code presupposes 5 million rubles of fine, not 30,000. You see the difference? Something is happening here just as how she's persecuted. But yeah, remember I told you that we need to use critical thinking, not being biased. Uh, so let me just rewind it and I'll get into the arguments for. So let me start with my favorite topic. Uh, Moscow State University professors who try to change their shoes and prove their point. Uh, for instance, it's, well, I, I need to read his name, Abbas Gulyamov, who kind of supports Ukraine. His wife has a Ukrainian flag on her profile picture, but at the same time, he's a true Soviet hybrid person. He calls everyone who is against him a Ukrainian bot. He also argues that, oh, it's not a media stunt for sure. Everyone who criticizes uh, this is actually like a, a, a freshman at a university and there is no real argument. His main idea is that he used to be a host at Pervy Kanal, the main state uh, channel uh, in Russia, and he thinks that it makes him an expert. But actually, I think that it makes him a comp... He makes he, uh, it makes him actually the part of the system who tries to protect that system. Well, I should also mention Navalny and Sobchak, who became uh, the first people to say that, oh, this woman is really brave. And Navalny is collecting money for her, while Sobchak uh, has published the video of the address by Marina Ovsyanikova. These people are no heroes in Ukraine. Uh, Navalny says that Crimea is Russia and Ksenia Sobchak is really known for uh, playing a big role in Putin's uh, in different twists. Uh, she used to be a technical candidate against him. Uh, she came to Colombia in New York. I, I remember people being euphoric about how she is brave and we all know how it ended. I really recommend you to watch the video that she recorded right after the elections ended, where she started basically spitting on American democracy, saying that everyone is a joker there and Black Lives Matter is uh, the proof that American democracy is doomed. Uh, this, is, this is what we're dealing with. You may think that these people are brave, but they're just pawns in a particular play. Don't be fooled. Okay, well, I, I, I remember, I tried to be critical, so I'm not critical, I'm opinionated. And I'll go with the argument against uh, Marina Avsyanikova being uh, just a brave woman risking her uh, life and life of her children. Let me show you all the arguments that I collected from the commentaries of experts and just regular people. Well, the first argument why it's impossible to be a real frank demonstration of opinion is that News in Russia are not live. And it's a technical question. In Vladivostok, it's like 12 hours ahead, while in Moscow, it's like six hours ahead. You know, six hours. So they have to show it in recording. The second argument is that Andreeva, a really known TV host, she's been there as long as Putin uh, in his presidency, she didn't even react to the noise behind and to the performance itself, she continued reading the news. Well, maybe she got trained to be so much FSB that she doesn't care, but it's kind of unnatural. It looks just weird that she had no reaction whatsoever. Super ведущая, чтоб менять эмоции с такой скоростью, надо обладать жесткостью духа, чтоб так вариться с робостью, надо навсегда распрощаться. У этой ведущей, скорее всего, дурацкие сентиментальные чувства притупились довольно давно. Я очарован ей, никак не ожидал. Спасибо центральный госканал за новое ощущение. Это вскрыл во мне мощнейший потенциал. Пришла любовь, мой индикатор любви привстал. Созерцание ведущей оказалось забористей, чем порно журнал. Вот ведь сучка, но сучка в хорошем смысле слова. Пол got puzzled. What would be the point? to make this stunt happen? What would it make to other people? Well, since uh, Kremlin and the FSB and KVD uh, uh, and uh, KGB did not exist just for a moment, but for 105 years, we kind of know their playbook and they repeat themselves. So the first thing is to attract all the attention onto themselves. Instead of talking about what's happening in Ukraine because of the Russian army, we are now talking about her. Is it a stunt? What's gonna happen to her? 
is she brave? What is she doing there in Russia? And blah, blah, blah. So she's switching attention again to Russians. And that's why I stopped watching what, uh, let's say, an opposition leader, Nivzorov or Navalny, say about Ukraine. Because they know they are the part of the system. They want white Russians to speak to white Russians. And all of us just look at that and decide what's our opinion on that. This is a theater. If you want to be in a theater, that's your choice. I actually want to fight for my country. The other thing is the content of her address. The narrative is very similar to the Kremlin. So Russia is a defender. We are brotherly nations. You know, we, we're actually one nation. That's what Putin said. You know, Ukrainians do not exist as a separate nation. And the other thing is that Putin is the one to blame. Nobody else. And we know historically that Russians do it to retransform their government so someone else can come into power and preserve their place. Well, yeah, you can dismiss Putin, but if someone else comes into his place and does the same thing, what's the point of all these deaths and all this resistance? We cannot achieve, we cannot achieve any goal if we allow revanchism in Russia. Also, a really important thing is to bring faith to Ukrainian enemy. It also a kind of a narrative that works for us, for Ukrainians, to think that there are different Russians. But actually, statistically, most of them support the war. And I know it because I try to negotiate it with different people, especially scholars and humanities. And what I get is actually, well, kind of harsh fascist statements about, you know, Ukrainians not being true people. And if they even acknowledge Ukrainians, they say they're Nazis and Banderovci and so forth. And, you know, like, if you accept this, you cannot be a Ukrainian because then you give up your sovereignty, give up your identity. Um, well, if it happens, it's not going to be happen to, to me. Привіт. Я їду в Росію стріляти. Так почалось. Now I will go into the speculations that I find especially productive. Uh, first one is Maxim Yali, who thinks that actually Maria Marina Avsyanikova can play a role into all this mess later on. You know, she's now a dissident player uh, and probably she will have a different position in future Russia if it, if it survives. The other person who actually produced a really interesting narrative on, on what is happening, and again, it's just a speculation, is that Ernst, Konstantin Ernst, who is the main producer of Первый канал, wants to avoid sanctions. Uh, his property got already seized in different countries. So if he shows that there is some kind of diversity at his state organized channel, probably it will be ele elevated. And uh, if you look at the front lead uh, of new the Financial Times, it says that sanctions are against oligarchs and uh, military men, but it doesn't mention media people. While they, their role, of course, is irreducible in killing Ukrainians. Dutkovsky also points out to two important things. The way that her presence uh, on TV is proven to be realistic by recordings of the screen on TV uh, by kind of regular Russians. Do you often record news on your phone expecting that someone will jump out? It looks like a stunt already. And the other thing is that Sobchak published it. We know that Sobchak is actually a daughter of the person who put Putin in power in the first place, the mayor of St. Petersburg in the 90s. Also, Dietkovsky points out to the narrative that she uses. She says, you know, it's, it's a brotherly nation. My father was a Ukrainian, making a particular chauvinistic stress on Ukrainians, meaning that Ukraine is a border state, not a particular country. This is, this is uh, how Surkov used to talk about Ukraine, saying that, you know, we, are all we all have bloody ties. That's why Ukraine is actually part of Russia. And without Ukraine, there is no Russia. Also, Dietkovsky is really right that while in Ukraine thousands of people died among civilians and soldiers, everyone will talk about a liberal, pseudo-liberal propagandist who got fined in $150. So she's stealing the show. And if you allow this to happen in liberal media, then you're playing their playbook. Thank you. There are also two interesting reasons that uh, Dietkovsky speculates about. 
first is that probably the Russian opposition tries to use this moment to, you know, kind of move the pawns on the uh, chessboard. But for us, Ukrainians, it doesn't matter. As I said, Navalny and Sobchak are not heroes in Ukraine. And the other thing is that kind of the person who produced propagandist discourses for eight years now becomes the focus and kind of is the victim of propaganda. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. So let me add my own speculation, kind of a historical context to what we see here. It's actually historically proven that the KGB, under the lead of uh, Andropov, from 1964 to 1982, and you know why he stopped being the head of the KGB? Right, because he became the leader of the USSR and he died in his position. So he was the one to play the dissident movement, to send people abroad, uh, making them into state-owned dissidents who basically appropriated dissident discourses to discredit opposition to the Kremlin. Uh, I can give one example, Roy Medvedev, who first was like a regular dissident, uh, well, uh, people were suspicious of him, but then suddenly he became anti-Semitic when he came to the US and everyone started thinking about uh, Soviet dissidents and be, as being a bit, uh, you know, lost in their ideas and uh, not being the part of a civilized world. Also Solzhenitsyn, who seemed to be, uh, a, you know, a state hero uh, who told about the Gulag, but in 1982 he published an essay in which he cri criticized uh, any Western uh, political ideas in the USSR, and especially Sakharov, uh, who, you know, was one uh, sitting already in Nizhny Novgorod, being under home arrest, uh, not mentioned in any news. So, you know, these dissidents can be well controlled, and it's not surprising that today, while Navalny is in jail, uh, there is a, a fake opposition leader who actually supported the war in Ukraine. It's really good to control narratives if you, th if you say that it's not coming from the Kremlin, but comes from its opposition. It's really naive to believe that these people represent anything but a home-owned, appropriated narrative on how it should be. Okay, you may ask me, how do I know about Roy Medvedev working for the uh, KGB? He returned to the Soviet Union and in 2007 he got an FSB award for his input into the politics. He was basically acknowledged as a double agent for his 40 years of dissident career. And also there is a recent example, it's Nadezhda Savchenko, who was kind of captured in 2014. She was in Russian jail and uh, everyone hyped on that, that. Look, the woman, she's a pilot, she's a hero. She came back to Ukraine. She became a deputy of uh, the parliament in Ukraine. And suddenly she started voicing uh, the Kremlin's narratives. How could it happen? Well, she was working in her double agent position. We know it, it's, it's happening all, all over again. If you just jumped into the topic of Ukrainian and Russian relationships, you need to catch up on the context. The KGB has not invented anything else than just repeating what works for them for years, for, for decades. Don't be fooled. <clears throat> uh, okay, once again, let me rewind. I promise to be critical. I promise to ask questions and kind of give you for and against. It's your choice. I live here, I wake up three times during the night to survive bombing and I'm kind of, yeah, I have twisted mind right now. But I wanted to give you the information that will help you to make your mind straight. Is it brave to jump with a poster that says, I'm not guilty of lying for eight years? Is it true that Ukrainians and Russians are brotherly nation? I don't know, I don't think so. There is also one thing that I want to add. Whether she is trying to steal the show or she is trying to make her position straight that propaganda is really bad in the war, this will not compensate for what already has happened in Ukraine and what is happening now. Please, turn off this and help Ukraine to survive now. We need your attention on the important things, not on this pseudo media stunts thank you
So the place where we're recording this is called Heavenly Hundreds. The people who were killed in Maidan by probably the Russian snipers. I think this is the place that defines us as Ukrainians. It's deep in our heart. We will not surrender. Do you have to say something about this? Please comment. Please like it. And please share. Thank you for your attention.